So today we're going to take a look at a technique called Kerber Roasting. Now to do this we're going to use an Impacket script called Get User SPNs and we'll combine that with Hashcats and with the two of them we'll be able to get a user account's password. Now as usual I've got two virtual machines set up here, one that's a domain controller with this very basic Active Directory domain and then another which is our attacker machine which is not a member of the domain, completely separate. Now if you've seen some of my previous videos on Kerberos attacks a lot of this will be very familiar. We're basically doing the same thing that we did in the attack where we used Impacket's get NP users script to um, attack accounts that don't have Kerberos pre-authentication enabled. It's a very similar thing, but just with a different part of the Kerberos authentication mechanism. So you'll definitely recognize some things if you've seen those videos. If not, don't worry, because I will try and explain things in a decent amount of detail in this one. This is also going to lead very nicely into another video, which will be coming very soon, on Kerberos silver tickets. So I think to start with, we'll just do a very quick demonstration of the attack, and then I'll go through and explain exactly how it works. So if we run get user spns.py, the impact it script, um, I'm just going to familiarize myself with the syntax again. I'm pretty sure we literally just need to specify the domain. Uh, first of all, actually, as well, we need to set our DNS server to point to the uh, machine that we're going to be attacking, the domain controller. Now, to be fair, if all you're doing is this get user spns script and the Kerber roasting attack, you could probably get away with just doing the dash DC IP option with the impact script to specify the DC IP address. You probably don't need to set your DNS server, but it's going to make things easier when we come to do the Kerberos silver ticket attack. So I'm just going to do it now, and it will also mean that we don't need to specify the IP address with this get user SPN script. So we're going to here change adapter options, because the thing is with Kerberos, you need to use fully qualified domain names. You can't use IP addresses, by default anyway. Um, there is an option you can set to enable that, but by default, if you're using an IP address to connect to something, uh, you won't be using Kerberos authentication, it'll fall back to NTLM. And for this attack, we need to use Kerberos authentication, so I'm gonna just put in the domain name and then the user account that we're gonna use. That is one thing to point out, is that for this attack, you need to already have some credentials. They don't have to be anything special. If we look at this account that I'm gonna use, it's not a member of any special groups. It's literally just domain users and some random security group. Uh, so there's no special permissions required for this, just any user account in the domain. So we're going to specify the domain and then the user and the password and then that should be all we need actually. So let's just try that and there we go. We get some results. Again I'm going to explain exactly where these results are coming from, what they all mean, but to start with I just want to do a demo of the attack and just kind of prove that it works for people that just literally want to see a step-by-step -step guide of how to do it. So if we do that again and we do dash request, we will get TGS, or you can just think of it as a load of encrypted data that was encrypted with this account's password. So if we can crack this, then we can get this account's password. And that is essentially what the curb roasting technique is all about. So we'll take all this and we'll just put it into Hashcat. Just copy that. And to find out what mode we need to use in Hashcat, I've just gone to the Hashcat examples. We'll just search for Kerberos. Um, it's not this one because we're not doing an AS rec attack. We're doing a TGS attack. So it will probably be this one here. And you can see there we've got the type of encryption is type 23. And if we go back to our machine, you can see here we've got type 23 as the encryption type there. So we will just take this number here, 13,100, and we'll do dash M, 13,100. And then we will paste in the information that we got from the script. And we'll just say we want to use the rockq.txt file to crack it. So I'll go through, and in a few seconds, there we go, it's cracked it. So the password was just set to the same thing that I set the other account to. Obviously there would normally be different passwords, but you can see here the password is just password with a zero. So we now know the password for that SQL service account. And we didn't really have to do anything. We just run one script, pass it into Hashcat, and we get the passwords. And that will work for any user account in the domain that has been set to run a service that authenticates with Kerberos. And again, all we needed was just any domain credentials. We don't need any kind of admin rights or anything like that. So now that you've seen the attack in action, let's take a look at how this actually works and why this works. So if we go onto our domain controller here, and we'll look at what actually makes this account vulnerable essentially, it's the fact that it's a user account and it's got in its attributes, go up to here, in the service principal name, it's got some values in here. And that is essentially all that makes it vulnerable to this kind of attack. So for an example, if we just create a new user account, put test, and we'll just set the password to test as well. I'm just kind of in the habit of always ticking those things. Uh, okay, apparently test isn't a good enough password. We'll just use password with a zero again then. 
my favorite default. Okay, so now we've got that account in there. Because we haven't set any service principal names on it, when we run this script, it won't find that account. Okay, so we're not seeing our test account in there. But as soon as we add a service principal name, you don't have to do this from um, the attribute editor tab, you can do it from PowerShell and there's also a set SPN executable that's included with the windows, but I'm just used to doing it through here. Um, I'm wondering why I can't see it and that's because I've got that tick so it only shows attributes that have already got values in them. But yeah, so if we go into here and we add, we'll just put test slash test. We'll just put anything in there. Apply that. And now if we go back to our attack machine, run the same script again. Now we could basically just get the password for this test account because it's got a service principal name set. So why is that the case? And also why don't we see, or why don't we go after computer accounts? Because if we look at a computer account and we go to the attribute editor tab, look at service principal name, see that's got loads of service principal names. So why aren't we attacking that? Or why, why doesn't the script find that? Essentially because computer accounts have very long complex passwords that get automatically set by the system every 30 days, I think it is by default. So trying to crack them is a very, very long process, potentially impossible. I can't remember off the top of my head what the, the password length is, but I've got a feeling it's something like 150 characters of just random bytes. So we can't just throw the RockQ password list at it and assume that'll get cracked or even doing a brute force crack would take forever. So that's why we don't go after computer accounts. User accounts, on the other hand, as you've just seen, we can set very dumb passwords for. Passwords that will probably be in a common password list. And it's quite common for people to do this, to create a user account to run a service. Like if we open up services.msc, this is where an admin would set this. So if we go to the MSSQL service, what's it called? It's called SQL server. You can see here that I've set that to run using that service account. So this is that account there, that SQL service account. We've set it to run as that account. We've had to put the password in here. And that's a pretty common thing for admins to do because say you've got a service that needs to access some files, especially if they're on another server, it's got to access something across the network. If you just leave this running as local system or network service, then when this goes to connect out to a file server or whatever to do something with those files, say this was running as network service, like this one here, you've got to grant that account permission to access those files, which now means every other service that's running as a network service has permission to access those files. And if they're on a remote file server, now you've got to grant the computer account that the service is running on, you've got to grant that permission to access those files, which means that any service on this entire computer that can access things over the network has now got permission to access those. There are some ways around that. I'm not gonna go into that too much. I'm just trying to give you a rough idea of why someone would actually set a service to run as a user account. Um, like you can use these NT service accounts now, and that's fine for accessing local files and resources because now you can grant permissions to this virtual service account. That's technically the name for them, virtual service accounts, if you want to look into them more. But yeah, they get created for each service and it'll just be NT service slash the name of the service. So yeah, that's fine for local access, but if you want to access something across the network, then again, you're going to have to grant permission to the computer account, which means any service on this entire computer can now access those resources, and that might not always be desirable. So that's a reason for using an actual user account in the domain, because now you can grant permissions anywhere on the network to that user account, and then set the service to run as that user account, and now only that service can access those files and resources. The better solution, though, is to use a managed service account or a group managed service account. And they are user accounts in Active Directory that essentially behave like computer accounts. They get their passwords set to those long complex passwords and changed automatically. Um, and then you can use them to run a service. So that's kind of the, the solution to this. But I'll be honest, they're not particularly well, I was gonna say they're not well supported. They are like they do, they work perfectly, but actually working with them is a bit of a pain. Like you can't just right click here and create a new managed service account. Maybe there's some newer tools since I last looked into them that make it easier to use now. But yeah, when they first came out, managed and group managed service accounts, you had to do it all with PowerShell and it was a little bit awkward. So there we go, that was a bit of a long tangent, but hopefully you understand that it is kind of common for people to set services to run as a user account from Active Directory. So if that service, in this case SQL Server, if that service wants to use Kerberos authentication or wants to support Kerberos authentication, it has to have a service principal name. That's just part of the way that Kerberos works. I'm not gonna go into that too much right now, but long story short, it has to have a service principal name for it in order for it to be able to respond to Kerberos authentication requests. And that service principal name, as you can see, is made up from the service name, which can be whatever the service wants it to be, 
and then the machine name and optionally a port number. Also optionally you don't have to have the full uh, fully qualified domain name there, you'll see in a lot of the default ones, go to here, it'll just have, or it'll have both, sorry, so it'll have the service and then just the computer name and then it'll have the service and the computer name and the fully qualified domain name. And that's because when a client tries to connect to one of these services, it has a few options of how it could specify the name. You see here there's different variations again. So the service principal names have to support each of those that a client could potentially use. So going back to our SQL SVC account, so we know that it's got these SPNs. How does the Impacket script take advantage of that? If we go back to our workstation, essentially all the script is doing in this part here where we just run it the first time without dash request, all it's doing is just an LDAP search just to find any user accounts that have got a service principal name. We could do this ourselves just as easily. Um, I'm gonna do this from the DC just so that I don't have to bother setting up like a, a reverse shell. Um, but assume that you were doing this remotely, you could do this with uh, like LDAP search or if you had a reverse shell going on the remote machine, you could do it this way. But yeah, it's just an LDAP search. So if we do like get AV user, we set an LDAP filter, we'll do service principal name equals anything. Okay, so this is gonna find any user accounts that have got a service principal name or it would if I actually put the dash in the right place. There we go. So what has that found? It's found the KRB TGT account, which we can ignore. And that's a built-in Kerberos kind of master key account, which I've covered in other videos, the golden ticket one specifically. But yeah, so other than that, it's found our SQL SVC account and it's found our test account, which is exactly what the impact script found. If we wanted to actually see the results, so we'll just do properties and then we'll say we want to include service principal name. So now we can see that we get this attribute added to the results and it shows us the SPN for each of these accounts. So here we're seeing those same SPNs that we saw in Active Directory users and computers. So that's essentially all the impact script is doing at that point. It's just doing an LDAP search for user accounts that have any value in the service principal name. So nothing crazy there, nothing special. So we flick back to the workstation. What it does when we do dash request though, is if we open up Wireshark, and this is where things will get very familiar for people who've seen the uh, get MP users video. If we just do a capture on the network card and we run that, and we'll stop this. I'm gonna filter it for Kerberos. Now what we can see is that we get the normal Kerberos kind of handshake going on to authenticate the user account. And this is authenticating our legitimate user account, the uh, A Smith account. And in a previous video where we were looking at Kerberos pre-authentication and the get NP users script, this part here basically wouldn't happen because if pre-auth is disabled, we kind of skip this part and we go straight to here where we just get back some encrypted data that's encrypted with the user's password and we can crack it. Again, that's covered in a previous video, not gonna go over that now. So even though pre-auth is enabled on this account, we've got legitimate credentials for this A Smith account, so we're fine. Then we move on to the TGS part. Now, these are doubled here because we've got one where we're requesting that test service and then we've got the one where we're requesting the SQL service. So we're just gonna ignore the test service and we'll focus on this SQL part. It's not gonna explain everything that Kerberos does, but for this part that we're gonna focus on, just accept that we log on as our legitimate user account, we get what's called a TGT, and then we can use that TGT to request a ticket for a service. The TGT proves that we are who we say we are. So in this case, we're saying I am A Smith, our user account, and I want to access this MS SQL service on this computer. The Kerberos server, so the domain controller in this case, you would think would do some kind of like authorization check to see if this user account is allowed to access this service, but it doesn't. It just says, sure, here's a, a TGS, which is another kind of ticket for that service. You can use that to access the service. Now it's then up to the service itself to decide if this user account is allowed, which is fine because the service will look at this, this encrypted data here, which we'll get onto in a second. This contains the, the user's username and the groups that they're a member of. So the service can look at that because it can decrypt this. Again, I'll explain how and why in a second. It can decrypt that. It can see this user is a member of these groups. It's got this username, this security ID. Are they allowed in? So that's fine. The access control side of things is still okay. It's not as if this part here means that we can now just access every service in the world. The service can still easily deny us access. But to actually do the Kerberos authentication side of things, we need to pass it this TGS ticket. And that's what it's sending back to us here. This TGS rep is the domain controller sending us a ticket that we can then pass on to whatever service this is that we're trying to access. So this encrypted part is the important bit really. You can see it's encrypted with this E-type of 23. And if you remember in the Hashcat examples, in fact, let me show you it. 
we ended up using this here because it's a TGS rep and it's E-Type 23. Okay, so Kerberos, TGS rep, E-Type 23. If we go back to our machine, we'll see we've got a Kerberos, TGS rep, E-Type 23. So that's why we use that hashcat mode to decrypt this text here. So like I've said multiple times, this is encrypted and it's encrypted using the password of the service account that is running this service. Okay, so this is the service we're trying to access and those service principal names that we were looking at earlier, the SPNs, they tie that user account, which was called SQL SVC in our case. That SQL SVC user account is tied to this service because it has the service principal name that matches this service and this machine name. Okay, so that means that Kerberos and the domain controller knows that that account is what is running this service. So when it sends out a TGS for this service, again, a TGS is just a ticket that the user gets back and that they can then pass on to the service to prove that they are who they say they are and that they are a member of these groups. And the way they prove that is the fact that this is encrypted with the password of the service account because the user doesn't know the password of the service account in theory. The only things that know the password of the service account are the service because it's running as that service account and the domain controller because that's where the password is stored. So that acts as like a shared secret key for all of this. And that proves the authenticity of this whole ticket that we're sending. So now when the service receives this request from us, we pass on this ticket, this encrypted ticket to the service. It can decrypt it because it's got its own password and then it can read the contents of it. If we tried to just fake our own ticket that said I'm a member of the domain admins and we sent that off to the service, we wouldn't have the password to encrypt this correctly. So the service would decrypt it using its password. It would just fail the decryption. It just wouldn't make any sense. So it would know that this wasn't a legitimate ticket. Obviously where this all falls down though is if we do manage to get the password for this account, which is what we've just done with this attack. So then we can just fake this whole ticket ourselves. We can say, I am a member of domain admins. My SID is the administrator SID. We can fake it. We encrypt all of that with the password that we know for the service account, create this whole ticket, send it off to the service. We don't even have to talk to a domain controller at all. We just talk to the service. Because we use the right password to encrypt all this, it can decrypt it, thinks it's legitimate and then it thinks we're a member of domain admins. And that is basically what a Kerberos silver ticket attack is, but we're gonna look at that in more detail and do a demo of that in the next video. But yeah, for this one, that is probably about it. I feel like I've been a little bit quick going over all this stuff and maybe some diagrams would help when we're talking about you know, passing tickets around. But to be fair, there's a lot of examples online if you just search for like Kerberos authentication diagram or something, you'll see exactly how it all kind of flows. It's not that complicated. It seems it at first, especially when you're looking at it in Wireshark, but it's really fairly straightforward and there's some good videos and good articles that explain it. And this is a real quick recap, just to kind of run down of the whole process. The whole attack starts by us having some legitimate credentials. We use those to authenticate with a domain controller and do an LDAP search to find any user accounts that have a service principal name associated with them because that means that when we request a TGS for that service, so we request a TGS for this service here, we will get some data back that is encrypted with the password of this account, which is what this data here is. We can then crack that offline with Hashcat and get the password for this account. Now that's kind of the end of that attack, but it feeds very nicely into a silver ticket attack. Obviously we could, now that we've just got the password for this account, we could just look around as that account. You know, maybe that's got access to something special that we didn't have access to with these credentials. That's quite likely because it's a service account. It can probably do more than a regular user account. Um, so that is a perfectly valid attack on its own, but like I say, it feeds very nicely into a silver ticket attack because now we can forge our own TGS and just claim to be a member of whatever groups we want. So I think that covers it. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them in the comments as always. And yeah, I will see you in the next video.